Welcome once again to In the Trenches with Dave Lappin, brought to you by First Star Logistics in our beautiful First Star Logistics studios, as always. We did a live stream on Sunday after the Cincinnati Bengals game against the 49ers. And since then, we've gotten a lot of questions from people that uh, observed the live stream, and we want to answer some of those. So that's what we're going to do right now. All right, Andrew says, his statement is, I'm really worried that was the dagger in our playoff chances. Needed that win with so many tough games ahead. Never know, Andrew. Could very well have been. I mean, was the Jets game a dagger? You don't know when the dagger is going to occur. I mean, you lose football games sometimes should have won in hindsight, when you, in retrospect of what took place during the course of the football game. But now all you can do is your margin for error has totally Condensed. It's shrunk to absolutely nothing, literally. They have four games remaining. In my opinion, they have to win three of them. That, that's the way it, it seems to me. I'm not sure nine and eight will get you there. I think 10 and seven has a chance. So you look at the remaining games, as you make mention of. Two of them a division contest. Be great to get those. I mean, you beat Baltimore here in Cincinnati. You beat Cleveland up in Cleveland. You're five and one in the division. If you get to the tiebreaker, you've got it locked up. I mean, a 5-1 and division record is pretty strong. That's why you're right. This Denver game becomes vitally important because the other matchup is against the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, it's here in Cincinnati, but they're starting to play really good football, complimentary football. Their defense was carrying them. Now their offense is starting to get things figured out. They're not turning it over as much. They're playing really good football. They're scary. I mean, they've been to the Super Bowl for a reason. You know, it's that's a good football team. But maybe you run the table. I, I was just talking earlier uh, today about a, a, the 2012 team that was 7-5. and five. Tony Romo's Dallas Cowboys come to Cincinnati and beat the Bengals 20-19 to 19 to knock them down to 7-6. and six. And it's like, oh, man, that was a gut blow there. That's a gut-wrenching loss. Well, the very next week, they won a football game in Philadelphia, and they beat them pretty handily, beat them by 21 points, and now they go to 8-6. and six. Then they have to go to Pittsburgh, and they win a slugfest, a brawl in Pittsburgh, 13-10 to 10, on a 43-yard field goal with eight seconds left in the football game by Josh Brown. I mean, just an unbelievable football game. They didn't score an offensive touchdown. Leon Hall had a pick six, 17-yard interception. For a touchdown, the only touchdown thrown in the game, Antonio Brown, a 60 yarder from Ben Roethlisberger. It was a defensive battle, a defensive war. Neither team had 290 yards offense, but the Bengals win the game. They win the game at the gun after a 21 yard pass to AJ Green from Andy Dalton sets them up. They get out of bounds uh, with 14 seconds to play. They hit the field goal with eight seconds to play. And they win the game. Then they beat Baltimore by seven points, 23 16, I think it was, to win three in a row. Now all of a sudden they're in the playoffs. It's happened. It can happen. It can happen again, but you can talk about it all you want. You have to go out and do it. Have to go out and start winning football games. And you can't say close, no cigar. We didn't quite get that done. It's been a roller coaster. Going to have to even that roller coaster out and start winning some football games. There's no question about it. All right. Next up is space night 79. I like it. Space night. Cincinnati is two and four in the last six games after a five and two start. Lost in the last two home games against two teams that were 500, only led for maybe five minutes total out of 130 minutes. Correct. That's including overtime. Neither offense nor defense is playing a full game. Very erratic. Throw special teams in there because that loss against the 49ers was a big part of it was due to two muffed punts, two fumbled punts, giving short fields to the 49ers. I mean, you're exactly right. I was thinking about that myself. The Bengals' only lead they took in the last two home games, eight quarters of football at Paul Brown Stadium, they led in overtime by three points. They never had a lead in any other quarter of the Chargers game or the 49er game. Think about that. That's, that's, not, that's not playoff caliber football right there. Okay, here's some more facts about how big of a roller coaster is but. It has been for the Bengals. Like you said, 
five and two start. At that point, they're the number one seed in the playoffs in the AFC. They had just beaten Baltimore 41 to 17. Nobody had scored 41 points against the Ravens in Baltimore under John Harbaugh's coaching regime. The Bengals are looking phenomenal. They lose to Baker Mayfield and Mike White by a combined 28 points. Baker Mayfield by 25, Mike White by three. They lose those two football games. Then they outscored the Raiders and the Steelers by 50 points. They outscore those two football teams. And then the Chargers game is kind of like a microcosm of the roller coaster. The first 20 minutes of that football game, the Chargers outscored the Bengals 24-0. The next 25 minutes, the Bengals outscore the Chargers 22-0. Then in the final 15 minutes, the final quarter of the football game, the Chargers outscore the Bengals 17-0. Of course, that was that big fumble recovery, touchdown, all those things that go along with it. Bengals basically handed a football game to the opponent once again. So the roller coaster has been going on for a while now. And the roller coaster took place in this 49er game as well. The Bengals are down 14 points in the in the fourth quarter. And they come back to tie the game and then take the lead by three points in overtime. Their only lead in those two football games at home, and then they lose it. Can't hold on to that lead. So it has been a roller coaster. Here's another demonstration of the erraticness of this football team. The only team in the NFL going into last weekend's action that had four wins by 19 or more points and two losses by 19 or more points. That's a little bit of a roller coaster as well. Have to get off that roller coaster. I mean, <laughs> and, and the biggest the biggest reason for the roller coaster ride is turnovers. I mean, here, here's the numbers now. Seven wins, the Bengals have given the football away five times. Very, very tolerable, less than one a game. In the six losses, they've given it away 16 times, 16 turnovers, 16. It's like a bakery. They're making turnovers every single day and giving them away. I mean, it is unbelievable just handing people football games. That has to stop. When the Bengals have had multiple giveaways, they're 0-5 this year. When they've had one or fewer giveaways, one or none, they're 7-1. and one. It's very simple. This league is turnover-driven. This football team is totally turnover-driven. When they cough the ball up, they lose. When they hold on to the football, demonstrate ball security, they win. It's that simple for this football team, like it is for a lot of football teams in the NFL. Okay, Tim says, I saw a little bit of Marvin Lewis and Zach Taylor today, way too conservative at the wrong times. And Lap, do you think we have to go 4-0 to get in the playoffs? Well, I think 4-0 definitely gets you in the playoffs. I think three and one would get you into playoffs, but you have to win the right games. I think you have to win both of the division games to make sure that you have that tiebreaker locked up and you would with a five and one division record and then beat the Denver Broncos. I think Kansas City, even though it's here in Cincinnati, will be a tough team to beat, but it's not impossible. They could run the table. They could go four and all. It's not impossible. I do think that uh, Marvin, as a defensive-oriented head coach, was a little bit more conservative in his posture than a lot of offensive coaches the Bengals have had. And Zach falls into the offensive coach category. I do think, though, that uh, Minnesota, when he went forward on, on fourth down in his own t field, own half the 50-yard line, Bengals territory, and didn't work out, and Minnesota took advantage of it and then started getting some momentum, the Bengals did come back and win that game in overtime, but it put the team in jeopardy. It's been a little bit more conservative since then, since he decided to be very aggressive at that time frame. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds down the stretch here of this of these final four games. Um, but you know, you you make a decision on fourth down. It's like, boy, you're you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. You know, what if he does go for it on fourth down and uh, and it and it doesn't materialize and you know. That, that backfires on him. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to say after the fact. I will say this, though. Zach Taylor is the most transparent head coach I've ever seen about um, making decisions and the thought process and his decision-making than I've ever, I've ever experienced in, in, when he's dealing with the media, with the press. I mean, after the football game, he said, I probably, on second down and at the 26-yard line in overtime, I probably – 
after we getting four yards on first down. I called a play that we had ripped for a six-yard gain earlier in the football game, felt good about it, and honestly, it was there. It just wasn't blocked very well. If they make that first down, it's a moot point, but they didn't, and so second down run, third down have to throw the football after a first down run, and people are jumping all over that. And a lot of coaches that that I've uh, dealt with in the past would have said in the in the post game press conference, ah, you can second guess anything. You can second guess, you know, why did I not throw the football instead of running it? Well, if I threw the football and the quarterback threw an interception, you'd be all over me. If we th I threw the football and the quarterback got hit and fumbled the football, you'd be all over me. So it's it's easy to second guess. It's easy to play the hindsight uh, game, all that sort of thing. And that's all very true. Zach didn't go there. Zach said, yep, I'm going to have some, I'm going to lose some sleep tonight over that. Uh, as I think about it on second down, it probably would have been smarter on second and four to let Joe Burrow, who had gotten us to that point with an unbelievable performance in the fourth quarter and overtime, let him go ahead and win the football game. And if I had to do it over again, I'd probably do it over again. Then on Monday, uh, he did say I lost some sleep <laughs> about it. So um, that's about as honest and and uh, forthright as I've ever seen. Uh, totally transparent uh, that I've ever seen out of a head coach in those in those situations. To be quite honest, because hindsight is twenty twenty, and if they had ripped that uh, that run for six yards in a first down, it have to be a different thing to talk about. Jesse Bates's potential interception that didn't happen might be talked about more. The taunting call might be talked about more. In a football game like the Bengals had, there are 15 things that if any one of them went differently, the outcome's different. Just one of them. And there's probably 15 of them in minimum. Those games would keep me up at night as a player. And I would. I'd lay down on my back and look at the ceiling, and the ceiling was a big movie screen. And I'd just see film, game film, of plays that, oh, if that went differently, if that one went okay, if that one didn't, next thing you know, it's 2.30 in the morning. Next thing you know, it's 4.30 in the morning. You're not getting sleep. It can be tough, man. There's no question. Bengal Babe, you bring up a question that I've heard a lot the last few days. Ever since Joe Brady was let go, basically, by the Carolina Panthers, they should bring Joe Brady in. They should bring Joe Brady in to run the offense. They should bring Joe Brady in to be the play caller. Well. With four games left in the season, certainly not going to be that for this season. There's no question about that. And I'm not sure you bring Joe Brady in for those kind of roles necessarily. But let's face it, Joe Brady and Joe Burrow made beautiful music together. I mean, they respect each other. And they had a great season together. So I don't know. Do you think about uh, bringing Joe Brady in to be a, a consultant, offensive uh, consultant, offensive analyst, offensive whatever? I mean, he's just another guy that uh, has a real good familiarity with what Joe Burrow's about, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Or if you're content that you got a good handle on that anyway, and you don't need Joe Brady to add to that uh, add to that formula. You've already got a pretty good, a perfect relationship going with Joe Burrow and the rest of the coaches as it's structured. I don't think you necessarily replace any of the current coaches with Joe Brady. Do you add Joe Brady to the mix? And you see it all the time. Teams will bring coaches in as special assistant to the head coach, uh, offensive consultant, defensive consultant. I mean, it happens. I don't know. Something to maybe think about. We'll see. Tim reaches out by Twitter. Despite the loss, congrats to Jamar Chase and Joe Mixon. They get 1,000 yards each. So proud of you guys. He compliments Dan Horde and I doing a job on the radio that he likes. Wayne Box Miller doing his thing as well. And he says, good luck next Sunday. Have a great week. Good day, Dave. Well, you make an interesting point, Tim. That is, congratulations to all. It used to be, back in the day, if you had a 3,000-yard passer, a 1,000-yard rusher, and a 1,000-yard receiver, that trifecta was, whoa. I mean, that was something to really strive for. In today's NFL, particularly now with an extra game with 17 games, the ante's upped a little bit. But Joe, Joe Burrow already has well over 3,000 yards passing. So now it's like 4,000 yards for the quarterback, a 1,200-yard rusher, and multiple 
wide receivers of a thousand yards or more, maybe getting a wide receiver up to 1500 yards. And the Bengals are tracking for some significant numbers. Joe Burrow is going to blow over a thousand years, 4,000 yards. In my opinion, he's going to blow way over 4,000 yards. Joe Mixon has his thousand. He's going to track 12 to 1500. I think depending on if he has that big game somewhere, which he's already had already this season, multiple times. Jamar Chase is at 1,000 yards. Higgins is tracking for 1,000 yards. So you could have a 4,000-plus-yard passer, a 12 to 1,500-yard rusher, and two receivers, one, what, 1,200-plus yards and the other one at 1,000? Pretty darn good. And you look at it, the Bengals are the only team in the National Football League that has three receivers with 55 catches or more. Right now, Tyler Boyd has 55, Higgins has 57, Chase has 60. Now, other teams have three players with 50 catches or more, but it includes a running back or a tight end. We're talking three different receivers. That's distribution of the football. One has 55, one has 57, and the other one has over 60. So Joe Burrow is attacking all quadrants of the football field. He's distributing the ball like a point guard. That's really good football. So offensively, the Bengals have done some outstanding things this season. There are no two ways about it. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. <laughs> Brakes? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right, you yeah. know. You know, you gotta get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out firststarlogistics.com.